In this episode, osteopath Kevin Longpray and I break down why there is so much confusion and polarization around the pandemic. We discussed much of the questions around the numbers, the testing, and even the controversy around best interventions. Our hope is to paint a broader picture that will help everyone make an informed decision that is best for themselves and find compassion for those whose decisions differ from our own. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to our show. I just wanted to make a couple more points that I talked about in last week's episode at the beginning when I talked about mental health and C60. I've had a couple of questions around that, so I just wanted to clarify a little bit more detail. There's essentially three ways that C60 can help specifically with mental health. Now, last week we talked about depression, but this could extend out into more areas of mental health. So it reduces inflammation, it increases energy, and then it restores hormones. So let's break each of those down really quickly. Inflammation. Chronic inflammation is related to many aspects of mental health. And that's what I talked about last week. Now, one of the key things is that chronic inflammation tends to be related to suppressed or lower dopamine levels. And we know that dopamine plays a role in many aspects of mental health. It's often related to depression. Would have People that have depression often have lower dopamine levels. People that tend to suffer with ADHD also often have lower dopamine levels. So by incorporating this powerful antioxidant, which is often hundreds of times more powerful than vitamin C, through that powerful free radical scavenging ability that C60 have, we can start to bring down inflammation that is often triggered by free radical excess. The other part is that it increases energy. The primary way that it tends to assist with energy is that it improves mitochondrial function in making ATP. Now again, lethargy, tired, low energy, this stuff often affects our mood as well. So by improving mitochondria function, which is related to lots of different problems, and there's many things that can really inhibit mitochondrial function. So things like methylation imbalances, mold exposure, a lot of these different things tend to very much suppress mitochondrial function. And that's gotten a lot of publicity over the last probably decade on how important mitochondrial function is. So again, reduces inflammation, can start to help with increasing energy. And then the third thing that C60 is able to help with is restoring hormones. So that we know that changes in hormones can dramatically affect mood. Think of something as simple as PMS and those fluctuations in hormones can dramatically affect how you feel. Now, one of the key things that C60 does is it also plays into the role of increase in production of pregnenolone, which is sort of the precursor to a lot of our other main hormones. So by helping to support pregnenolone, supporting hormonal health, again, we can play into the aspects of assisting with overall mood stability. So I hope that helps. If you have any questions about that, please feel free to ask me more about it. So if you'd like to check out C60, then just either click the link below to go to the C60 website and you'll get 15% off your order for the individual bottles or 20% off a subscription or just go to the inspirehealthpodcast.com website and then top right corner, you'll see a link where you can click and it will take you to C60 and you will get 15% off. Make sure that you use the coupon code, all in capitals, Dr. Loken, that's capitals, D-R-L-O-K-E-N. Put that in as the code and you will get 15% off your order. In today's episode, I sit down with a good friend and colleague of mine, Kevin Longpre, and Kevin's an osteopath in Quebec. And he and I have both been asked many questions over this last year by patients, just trying to understand what's going on over this past year around the pandemic and testing and this and that, and all these different questions that have come up over this past year. And ultimately they're trying to understand why is there such polarized views on this topic and as far as what's been going on over this past year. And so what we did our best to do was try to pull together as much of the information that we could and support it with some of the documentation that you'll see throughout this episode to just try to give an idea as to why this has become such a controversial or complex topic where people do have often very polarized picture of what's happening. And so throughout this episode, we talk about varying pieces of it and try and support it with the literature to make sense as to where people started to develop differing opinions as to what might be going on. So number one, our goal was to really try and 
broaden the picture so you might see some of the information that maybe you haven't been aware of that might open up the door for you to understand why people have such differing opinions. We also are hoping that by doing this that it also provides you to create a space where there's more compassion for people that do have very different ideas around what's going on than maybe what your personal ideas on either end of it. Because it is such a controversial topic and there's so much often information on either side that makes it different to see exactly what is going on and what it doesn't make the truth so obvious. And the other point that we are really hoping to make is to just provide a larger picture so that when you are making your decisions around certain interventions that you have as much of the information as you can to try and make the most informed decision for you as far as which course of action makes most sense and feels like it supports you and your life and your health and your family's health as best as possible. So I hope you enjoy this episode. If you have any questions on it, please feel free to post them. Um, my intention really is to just try and provide more information. I'm not trying to convince anybody of anything. Health is an individual aspect of what you need to come to on your own. You need to feel what ultimately feels right for you and make decisions based for you on your individual case by case. Health is very individual, but it's sometimes hard to make decisions without a larger picture of information. And my goal is always that you make individual choices based on your individuality and your specific needs. And from that place, then you can decide what makes most sense. But you first have to be able to see as much of the picture as you can in order to make those decisions. So I hope you enjoy this episode. And if you have any questions, post me some questions on the episode and in the YouTube channel at Dr. Jason Loken, ND. And I look forward to talk to you soon. Welcome to the Inspire Health Podcast. Your life is about to get a whole lot better. Have you ever felt like you tried everything and yet still couldn't find the answers or the solutions that you were seeking? Whether you're dealing with chronic illness, physical or emotional pain, I want you to know that your body is the most sophisticated machine on planet Earth. Your body holds unfathomable wisdom trust in it and learn from it. Know that there are answers and there are solutions to your specific health challenges and we will be uncovering all of them here on the Inspire Health Podcast. I'm so excited to be a part of your healing journey. Your transformation starts now. Hi everybody, welcome back to the Inspire Health Podcast. And today I am meeting up with a good friend of mine and a colleague, Kevin Longpre. So I have done some work with Kevin over the years and we have recently connected back up and we, uh, the Kevin's out in Quebec in Canada. And so we've been chatting back and forth the last while about just kind of what's been going on in this past year, like almost everybody has, and just sharing information back and forth to try and get an idea to better round out what is going on with the pandemic and what's been happening over this past year. And I mean, Kevin, I'm going to pass it over to you just to kind of introduce yourself and then we'll, we'll get into what our conversations have been about. Uh, thanks, Jay. Um, uh, it's great to be on with you. Uh, like Jason said, uh, we've been friends for quite a while. Jay even worked with us for a bit. Uh, God, that was probably like over 10 years ago, yeah. right? Back in the day. Back in the day. <laughs> uh, but uh, everything comes back, eh? So hopefully we do some work together again. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm... I own a clinic uh, with a business partner of mine in, um, in Montreal and um, I'm an osteopath. Uh, and yeah, like Jason's mentioning, we were, you know, like everyone very concerned in the beginning about what was going on uh, with this pandemic. And uh, we were off work uh, for three months, which gave us ample time to, uh, <laughs> investigate of, in look do a lot things. of reading <laughs> do a lot of reading and and uh add to the confusion uh, that was already <laughs> there um so yeah so i thought this was a great opportunity for us to come together and and maybe shed some light on a few things uh to one give perspective to people and i and i think to help them ultimately feel better about um what they're comfortable with and what decisions they want to make uh yeah move forward i think that's the key thing is um 
a lot of times when everything came up, I, I know myself, I just had an uneasiness feeling. I didn't really know what was going on. Information was all over the place. Uh, I mean, this past year has been bombarded by information, misinformation, disinformation. And, and a question that I've always asked guests in the last series that we did was, how do you discern truth from falsehood? And, and one of the things that came up over and over and over again was the importance of being able to connect back in to how your gut feels, what your heart tells you outside of just what we're getting intellectually. Yeah. And why I feel a lot of times, and, and the thing is, is you can get, you can be led astray in both ways. So the emotions can totally lead you astray if they're not guided by the heart wisdom and the gut instincts. But if you can get in a grounded place and connect with those and then get an idea of what resonates or doesn't resonate with you. And then from there, with a place of openness, can we now explore some of the different information to try and make sense of why am I feeling like this? What's yeah. being triggered up? And then you can start to try from that place and a sense of openness to discern as best you can sort of logically and through reason. And so what Kevin and I both noticed as we were talking is like, I mean, we're both clinicians. So we we get questions all the time from patients. And so as a clinician, you're, you're wanting to understand more and more stuff. And depending on who your clientele is, you get a lot of different types of questions. And just like, just like we're seeing in the world today, there's a, there's a lot of polarization. There's people that have very strong opinions on what is right and what is wrong on both sides of the fence when it comes to everything that's been going on this past, this past year. So like um, Kevin was saying, when we had some time off a little bit, you definitely start to dig in and look for stuff. And the reality is, is that most people do not have the time or the understanding to try and sift through material. One thing I have learned through doing interviews with lots of different people is that information that we get, even from studies outside of just what you see in social media or when you're Googling information, it, it's very difficult to really understand what's what. And even in, in really, you know, quote unquote, good quality, like scientific studies, the way stats are presented can also be very misleading. And so what yeah. we're wanting to bring up today, I read an article a while back and it was by, um, let me just pull it up here. It was by Dr. Lenek uh, Hoos, and I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, but I apologize if I'm not to Lenek. And uh, she did an article called Truth Digging in Times of COVID-19, Combating Conspiracy Theories Through Open Dialogue and Informed Consent. And I'm gonna put the link to that article because it was probably one of the best articles that I read that really tried to present, why do some of these alternative theories or these alternative ideas from the mainstream narrative develop. And this is a really important thing because what she says is basically you kind of end up in these two camps. It's like you're either following exactly what we're being told and we believe that to be completely true. And then what starts to happen if anybody, regardless of how decorated they are and intelligent and have all of the right credentials, if they're saying anything contrary, they're deemed very quickly as being either a conspiracist or, um, or a quack or whatever it might be. And some of these people that have been deemed that held very prestigious positions prior mm -hmm. to having alternative views. And so what we wanted to explore is like, why did some of these people that really do know what they're talking about have some different views and where are they getting those ideas from? And so I think what our goal is, through here is to kind of run through this article to some point and bring about some of the information that's, that's all very documented in the science and sort of show you where some of these different ideas are coming from. Because the reality is, is there's lots of stuff that's been happening this past year that, that will affect all of us at an individual level at some point. And there's also some very important decisions that we are all having to make in regards to things with, um, our children, with our cells, with how, what kind of um, intervention are we going to take to try and help to end the, the quote unquote, end the pandemic per se. Um, and we're all, and most people don't have all of the information because it's very, very difficult to have all of the information. And I'm not saying we have all of it either, but I think what we are trying to do here is to pull together enough that we can try to create more informed decision-making. Because I know myself, when I'm talking to people, 
most people have one picture of what's going on and they're completely unaware of other realities that are taking place around the information because some of the information is just not put out there very freely or it gets censored very quickly. And there's a lot of it is, in, is, is very accurate and often the same research that was used to implement certain interventions or certain policy. I couldn't agree more. Like, I, I like to go to backtrack when we're talking to our, our clients, you know, like he, there, there is, you know, you can notice right away that there are, there are people that are very, very concerned. They don't know where to look. They, a lot of things are being censored or they have this resistance to looking at something else because there's so much emphasis put on what it means to look at something like that and to actually question something either that's contrary to what the government's saying or to what the health agencies are saying or to what uh, certain physicians are saying. Um, and like you said, you know, to have such a contrast between, you know, not just any uh, person in particular, like these very prominent people that are, are totally being silenced um, is very concerning. And so, like you said, Jay, I think, I think hopefully if we can, kind of shed some light on that a little bit and give people a bit of um, an opening to, to, uh, to, to look a little bit harder at the information on a wider spectrum of things, to give them better, to, to prepare them better, to make better choices for themselves and their families. Well, then great. That, that's, that's basically the aim of what we're doing. That's the aim of what we do every day with the job we have, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I'm on, on board with that for sure. And in the end of the day, it's um, everything always comes down to the individual and what feels right for them and what resonates with them. And you got to remember that there, that's not ever going to be a solid yes or no or right or wrong for the entire population. Everybody's going to have different opinions and there's going to be a lot of factors that play into why something makes sense to somebody and not make sense to another one. And and so part of this is to kind of create some openness that uh, we create less polarization, that we kind of understand that there's a lot of information going on and different people, but depending on their history, on their overall set of health, on their conditions that they're going through, their age, all of these different things, certain interventions will resonate with some people more than other ones. And so we're going to kind of go through all of this and we'll bring up as many of the papers in the in the literature as we can so that if you're watching this on the youtube channel um, on my youtube channel be dr jason loken and d and then we'll also share this with kevin as well and wherever platforms he's going to put that on or, or link it to that one you'll be able to see all of that too so you can kind of check it up and i'm going to put the link to the original video so that you can actually go down and see all of the different research papers that are there that kind of document what we're talking about so you can get a clearer picture yourself so Let's jump into it. So we're going to break it down into probably like, you know, four or five key kind of questions or, or topics that I think are raised the most concern for people or the most confusion. And then let's look at why are they creating confusion. And then from mm -hmm. there, it opens up the door for you to then also look into it more if you want or see how that information sits for you. So yeah. First one, let's talk about case numbers and mortality rates, because those are essentially what sets the stage for public health policies. So yep. having a better understanding of what are the case numbers, how many people are dying is really, really important. And so if you haven't caught on yet, this is widely um, in debate as far yeah. as what's going on and what's not. So let's, let's look at why. And there's an article that I think is really, really funny here by Aaron Levenstein that says, statistics are like bikinis. What they reveal is suggestive, but what they conceal is vital. And this is definitely the case a lot of times when we look at studies. And um, if you want to get into that more, go check out an episode that I did on the Inspire Health podcast. I was with Dr. Eric Rifkin, and it was somewhere between episode 11 and 20, I think. So check down there, but it was looking at how stats are manipulated to present almost anything that we want to present. On, so, on that on that note, so it, rightly so, in the beginning, I think the 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 clearest one was when they had the predictive models, right, which were grossly inaccurate. Right. Thank God. So, but but nonetheless, you know, the, these these prominent people that were were looking at that, like I, offhand, I can remember um, there was uh, 
Ivor Cummins, who's a, yep. a biochemist that I've sent you some stuff from him that we can pull up later, uh, was talking about that and how he himself had done the numbers and how Dr. Uh, Michael Levitt did the numbers and uh, all, all these prominent people looking at these predictive models saying how out of whack they were and how inflated they were. Um, but, you know, the effect on the population is, is substantial when you're showing them that there's going to be uh, uh, a death rate that is the, that is I think it was four percent at the time that they were that yeah. they were saying um, yeah so yeah, yeah it was so huge it. and so then it it's like when you see something like that it kind of yeah. makes sense in some ways as to the protocols that were set up because yeah. it was it was incredibly scary so part of what what happens though is sometimes information is presented policy is made. And then even when new information comes up, the policy doesn't always change. And I think that's part of where, where then the discrepancy comes. It's like, okay, well, that didn't happen. So why are we still acting in accordance to what those stats said when now they're actually different? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a good point. Cause that's kind of initially where everything started from and sort of why people wonder like, why did we end up doing all of this stuff and the lockdowns and the, all of the measures that were taking place well, it was originally based on the fact that they thought we were going to have 4% of the population was going to die. And that's was grossly inaccurate. Right. So now when we look at numbers, there's kind of two sort of key things. So one thing that was, and this is also very different than what has ever been done before with other diseases. So contrary to other illnesses, a positive case of COVID-19 doesn't refer to a sick person, but to anyone who tests positive, even when they're asymptomatic. So that's different. That is different than what we have done for almost any other. It's like the flu. You don't test for the flu unless there's symptoms. So right. now it's like we're seeing massive amounts of, of positive cases because we're actually looking for asymptomatic, not just symptomatic. And that's never been done before. So we don't really have a measurement for that because it's, it's basically a whole different system than what's ever been done before. And then the other question that comes up around it is the way that we are assessing for positive cases, okay? And this brings up the measurement using the PCR test. So yeah. what, um, tell a little bit about what you're familiar with with the PCR test, and then we'll, we'll kind of break that down a little bit. Yeah, I know. This was, this was a tough one because uh, I'm trying to understand it. I, I think when I first started hearing about it was uh, Dr. Yearden from Pfizer. Who is it? Yeardin or Yeadin? Sorry, I think it's Yeadin. Yeah, could be Yeadin. It's like tomato, tomato. I can't remember exactly either. So he was she ex chief medical officer for Pfizer, um, and he was describing how the, this is what struck me is that we're using this this test that he's saying is absolutely not uh, called for. Uh, even the creator of the test was was a was was noted as saying that it was not made to diagnose viral uh, contamination um so th that 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 looking at that information to me was an understanding like for me i know it's a bit complex uh in terms of understanding but i know they from a sample they're they're trying to amplify to see if there's any fragmentation of of the virus in or markers related to the virus not the the actual um sequence of the virus if i'm not mistaken yeah and um so yeah so they're they were saying anything in excess of 30 percent amplification would be an increased number of false positives so this was his take on um and you can easily look it up he has so much yeah. stuff he's been very very vocal about it saying that you know, the amount of false positives due to the fact that many countries are amplifying the test results in excess of 30%. In Quebec here, I believe it was around 40, 42%. Uh, and so that, that was my kind of understanding of what the PCR test uh, was doing. And like you said, you know, and we're, and then we're getting these people that have these positive tests, but they have zero symptoms. So this created the, the, the fear in people that, oh, there's people walking around with, with the virus that could, you know, be dangerous. Yeah. And so, so basically what happens with the PCR testing, because I've talked to a lot of patients about this too, when they've, when they've asked about it. And this was one of the things that really 
was one of the ones that I struggled with the most because it didn't make sense to me. And so like Kevin yeah. has said, when I first heard it, they talked about the PCR test was actually never designed to do mass screening to test for uh, a viral problem. That was not the, it was not what the test was ever designed for. And that the problem was that as soon as you went over too many cycles for the test, it started to create a lot of false positives upwards of, of 85 to 90% false positives in, in, in some of the different studies. Yeah. And according to the CDC, I believe itself actually said 33 cycles was definitely the cutoff. And it's been shown anywhere between about 30 to 35. But the vast majority of the entire world that's been running PCR testing has been over 35. I think I saw in Canada was between 38 and up over 40, yeah. depending on the province. And then I watched a video a while back too with Fauci himself saying that anything over 35 was basically worthless because of all of the false positives. So, And the WHO just recently, a month ago, I believe, came out saying that there had to be stricter guidelines on the amplification process. So this is also really interesting. So, so and let me just show, this is, this is what the original study, and I'm going to share the screen here so you can, yep. you can see this. Okay, so this was the original study that was done, okay, detection of 2019 novel coronavirus by real-time PT-PCR test. Now, that was what the original study was. And then within a couple of days after that, it was actually retracted, okay, because it was grossly inaccurate. So that was the original study, and here's the retraction letter, and you can check all of that out. And and so what happened was all the policy was essentially set up based on this. Yeah. And then even though the information was retracted, the policy wasn't retracted or changed. And that's, that's one of the reasons that really stops, that starts to confuse people that are in the know of that because that makes no sense, right? Why would you base everything on a study that was proven to be basically null and void? Okay, so now we, we know that the original study Okay, yeah. was flagged as being fatally flawed. And then the retraction request letter that I showed you was published. And so, and also there is legal action that was taken in many different places, including Portugal and Germany. And I think that's actually more and more now as we go on. And like Kevin said, the WHO then also adjusted their rec testing recommendations. So what's really interesting with the PCR test is that if you have higher cycles, you're gonna get more positives, lots of false positives. But as soon as you dial your, your cycling down below 35 or even below 30, you start to get significantly less positives. And so in many ways, you can kind of control what the numbers look like by just changing the way that you're testing for it. Mm -hmm. And most people have no idea that that goes on. And it was actually the, the WHO adjusted their testing recommendations in December 2020 around the same time that mass vaccination was initiated. And then I was listening to Dr. Scott Jensen as well, and he was saying that within about an hour after the inauguration, they changed the testing again. They had lowered the PCR testing, and they also removed that it could no longer be diagnosed based on symptoms alone, which it was for quite a while, which is also why this, the flu literally came right down to nothing is one of the severe. one of the speculations as to why the flu also went down because those crossover symptoms look very similar. Yeah. And so those are some of the things to consider. So when that's going on and if we're basing policy on numbers and we can't completely trust the numbers or we don't know if we're getting accurate numbers, that creates room for a lot of unnecessary fear and anxiety and and it leads you to ask certain questions. So one of the critical questions that's asked in this article then is, how did the study in question make it through the peer review in record time? And how is it possible that this one study served as the basis for the pandemic response? Are numbers intentionally being inflated? And if so, why? Is the resulting mm -hmm. fear to anyone's advantage? So these, these would be why people start to have what you know, a lot of people term as conspiracy sort of ideas but if you, yep. if you look at what has been going on, you can understand why people are going to start to question. And what I think is important for people is to 
have some sort of healthy questioning based on what's being presented. And it's okay to question things. It's, it's totally okay. We're supposed to be able to question things and have different ideas. That's ultimately how we have dialogue. Like in my mind, this should be a big question that comes up with all of the experts where they sit and go, okay, why are we doing it like this? What's, what's the reason for it? Is this a concern? And have a real open dialogue around it so that then if they're if there is really legitimate reasons as to why they're doing it, then that can come out. But if it's not being transparent, that's where people start to wonder what else might be going on. Exactly. We should be uh, encouraging people to, to look a little bit deeper, to, to not just take um, the media's word for things or anything else too, because there is some interesting, you know, things to, to contemplate with why, why is it that a study like that can code? That makes me think of just, there are so many, they, like the Lancet study on uh, hydroxychloroquine and how that was a, a danger to, to, to people after it's been in the market for 60 years. And then all these physicians fighting back and looking at this study, questioning it, and then it's removed, but then it's too late. It's already done its rounds in the media and in the, the, you know, so Mm-hmm. You've seen this on many, many occasions where, so it's difficult. I, I can see how it can be very difficult if you don't take the time to really like what you're saying, Jason. I think that's a key component to throughout this podcast. Hopefully we could reiterate this is for people to really think what resonates with me, what makes sense to me, uh, putting things into perspective that way uh, can help people make a lot better decisions on on where they're headed and how they want to proceed with things. So. Yeah. And then you just, you stay open to lots of, I mean, I've looked through so much different information and I I get different pieces on all of it. And then I'm trying to understand where the, you know, quote unquote controversy lies and and why it is important to question. I think a lot of times we are, you know, as as much as I think people like the idea to question, we also don't question authoritarian very well. And um, we're almost taught not, especially. And so, There, there's, there's, it's, it's healthy to question things. It really is. And then try and get an idea of what's actually going on. And I think connect to what feels in your gut and then start to look into it and see if you can make sense of it on both sides. And, you know, it's like, you know, if you're presented with information that changes your beliefs, whichever way it is, that's yeah. probably a good thing. Just stay open because it's information comes in and out and we can stay in a grounded place, not looking at it through the eyes of, fear and worry or guilt or shame because when you're in that place it's hard to connect to what you're actually feeling and then we actually don't make very much very good decisions and that's a fact when you are not in a what we'd say like a heart coherent state or a state of um, heart coherence or heart high heart rate variability you do not make good decisions for yourself so sometimes what i do is if i feel like i'm making decisions based from a place of worry or fear or concern i will get myself out of that, I will go for a walk in the forest, or I'll slow things down, or I'll meditate, or I'll do something to try and get my body back into a state of alignment, a state of coherence, where I'm out of that fight or flight and more in that rest and digest part of the nervous system, and then ask myself the same questions. It's actually something Tan and I do all the time. It's like, if we're making a big decision on anything in our life, I have we have to get into that state before we make that decision, because yeah. a lot of times it's different, right? Oh, and if, very uh, different. Great, great, great point. Because I think that's come up so much during all this, where it's easy to to uh, get into a panic uh, and then make rash decisions based on fear and uh, uncertainty. So taking that time, like you said, to to make sure that you're you're in the right headspace, uh, that you do connect back with yourself, is crucial to to optimizing the decision making you're going to have and and make a better one for you and your, your, your families, you know? So yeah, yeah. Uh, great, great point. Yeah. So I think, I mean, it's tricky when everybody's going through tons of um, stress yeah. right at the moment, but it really is important to sometimes just shut stuff off for a little bit, get back inside and then ask yourself similar questions and see how it feels. I, I something that we would do for anything, whenever you're making any decisions on anything. And I really don't think people should make, the action of the decision until you really are in alignment with what that's going to tell, tell you to do. Like a lot of times yeah. if we're making decisions around something, I, I know the time to act on the decision is when 
for me, the feeling of being more drawn or excited or inspired to make the decision and the action outweighs the worry and the concerns or the fears of making the decision or the action. Right. So again, it comes back to a place inside of me and that's where the timing makes sense to, to make certain decisions. So for example, when we get into talking about the intervention that a lot of people are question, you know, wondering about and whether or not it's a good option for them, yeah. I wouldn't make those decisions until you know inside yourself what ultimately feels right on you based on what all of the information that you're aware of. And we will go through that in just a little bit here so that you're aware of, of some of the information that you might not be so aware of. Yeah. And I think to, to add on to what you're saying about decision making, you know, that you can see how difficult that is for people too, with the amount of division that this has created within families, within colleagues at work, within, you know, we made it a point in the beginning, uh, you know, we, we had many, many meetings with, with our staff, with, with the goal too of saying, listen, we need to be this not to disrespect anything uh, or anyone coming in with concerns or fears. That was actually the priority was to say, what can we do to, to put them more at ease, to allow them to um, optimize their immune system better by not being in a constant state of fear. So, yeah. you know, the number one thing, and we'll talk about some of these things after, I guess, but the, um, was, it was funny in the beginning was telling people to stop watching the news. Yeah, well, and that's, that's been mentioned many times. And it's, uh, I mean, it's tricky, because a lot of times, you know, when people are working, and they're, they don't have time to kind of investigate stuff, that's usually where they get their piece of yeah. information that informs them as to what's going on in the world. And, and um, I mean, we haven't, we haven't really watched news, or we really haven't even had a TV for about a decade now. So it's like, we just don't really entertain it too much. But it's a hard one because it's also like it, it's time so that before people go to bed, that's usually what they hear. That's usually what they listen to first thing in the morning. And, and if it's, if it's making you, I think a lot of times with that, it's like just dial in on how it makes you feel. And right now I think it's really important to, to pay attention to things that make you feel calm and more relaxed and the things that don't and yeah. designate more time towards the things that make you feel calm and start to remove the things out that don't really support you very much. And sometimes news is, is kind of like that. I mean, we'll check out stuff here and there just to get an idea of what's kind of the world dialogue. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we also look at a lot of other sources that I think are really important. So, so that kind of talks about the, the testing and the mortality rate. And so you get an idea of where there's some confusion around that and there's different information showing up and very valid questions as to why people would have concerns around that and question about it. Yeah. And then start to wonder, okay, so if that doesn't make sense, then what else might be going on? That's where people naturally would go. And I'm not saying where everybody goes on there is totally right either, but this no. is where the questioning comes. And it's, it's actually, you should be able to question that. Like if you were presented with information and it wasn't totally adding up, we should naturally be inquisitive to question that. And that's okay. Okay. Yeah. You shouldn't be shunned or, or deemed a, a bad person or a quack or a conspiracist. If you just have different opinions and you want to understand more levels to questions that should have better answers to them. That's right. So then the other one that I think we go to then that's a, another reason for why people have a lot of questions is around prevention and risk factors. So why some get severely sick and why others don't. Mm. And early on, this was really big. And you don't hear about this quite as much now, but initially, especially from my side of things, um, what, what are some of the other things that make people susceptible to getting sick? So you might have heard stuff where they talk about the germ theory versus the terrain theory. This has been an age old argument that goes way, way back. Um, Dr. Béchamp versus Pasteur. Exactly. Yeah. And so, yeah. and basically mainstream medicine kind of grabbed onto the germ theory and Yep. For whatever reasons, you know, and you're going to hear different ideas around that. It's not that there's not germs, but there's very different viewpoints on what that means. So it's kind of like the idea that if the terrain is healthy, then you don't become a hospitable breeding ground for disease. Right. The germ theory would say germs are sort of bad. They're dangerous. They're out to kill you. And we need to create things to basically destroy the germ. Yeah. Now, I would say where we currently are at this point is there's definitely a combination. 
my ultimate feeling in and what I see in practice and what I see in my own life is that if my terrain is healthy, which essentially means how am I eating? How am I moving my body? How am I exercising? What am I putting into my body? What are my thoughts like? What is my mood like? All of these sort of factors are part of the terrain. You know, am I, am I more in a state of happiness and appreciation than I am in anger or shame, right? Those things are going to have dramatic effects on your immune system. So this was one of the big things that came up originally was like, okay, well, why don't we spend more time focusing on some of the things that we can do to start to support our bodies to make it inhospitable for a disease? And yeah. I know right off the bat, I actually did put out some information on this. I created a podcast early on and I had to take it down almost immediately because I was talking about some of these interventions and I was actually quoting some of the studies that were being done on them and what they were finding, but we were not allowed to say anything outside of what Health Canada had told us that we could say. Right. And which was really disturbing for a, a, lot of, a lot of us because we knew how important some of these things were and even how how much literature there's been on some of these different interventions for decades on different types of viruses and immune system and all this type of stuff that was very supportive. Um, but now recently there was lots done specifically on this uh, COVID-19 syndrome and, um, and very good studies showing really great support. So maybe we'll break down some of the big ones here. So, and I think their question was, why are they not spending more time talking about this? It's, yes. it's very safe. It's inexpensive. It's super accessible. We know there's massive amounts of deficiency in some of these nutrients that play such key roles. So I, I think the first one that most people have heard about is vitamin D. Yeah. And vitamin D is literally a pandemic in itself. I mean, it's estimated that about 85% of the population is deficient in vitamin D. And this is one of the markers that we look at all the time. And I check vitamin D levels in almost everybody. And it's very seldom you ever see people in the actual sweet spot where they should be, where they really get all of the, the benefits to vitamin D. But what was being shown was that there's actually been a lot of more evidence to support the benefits specifically of vitamin D and COVID. Yeah. And so what some of these studies were showing was dramatically re reducing severity of symptoms which then you got to remember that results in less hospitalizations, uh, less ICU, le I, less ICU use, and less death. But it also reduces infection and infection time, thereby decreasing transmission rates and slowing the spread. So vitamin D's got some really good information on it. And I think it would be a vital component to what we're trying to do here. And when that first came up, I mean, that was getting shut down left, right, and center, just pulling yeah. it off. You weren't allowed to say anything about it. And, um, and I'm going to pull up a letter here because there was an open letter to the government. Oh, let me go back to one more here that I want to talk about really quickly when we talk that I think was actually really interesting too. I'll come back to I, that in one sec here. While you're pulling that up, I, I like the way you were describing too, Jay, the, um, the uh, viral, the viral role in the body. I think it's important to remember that, you know, that, you know, whether viruses, bacteria, these various things that, that the human body has and comes into contact with in the environment as well um, are crucial for the adaptability of that person to the environment. So it's like you said, I think what, that was a very, very good point is, is to remember that, you know, that's why we have certain families, let's say that someone, uh, and this is not to downplay anyone that has, has passed from this, obviously, like any other year when someone dies of a flu or dies of the, the complications due to a flu, I should say, um, it, th this is not something we take lightly. And, and obviously, we're not saying this to downplay that, uh, but it is to also help people understand that these are regular interactions we have with the environment that when your body does need this adaptation, it will get it and adapt to what's going on. And like the stats show, you know, a very high percentage of people will be completely fine. Um, so that's a very good point to remember because it's hard to kind of uh, get uh, the, the bulk of, of the population to understand that it, it isn't necessarily what, what we've always been told about this external 
a thing that is just going to be so detrimental to our health, you know, obviously with all these other factors that you're describing in terms of like optimizing health for sure to put all the more chances on your side. But uh, it is, it is concerning that that uh, was being censored and, and not discussed. And even like, look at, look at like, uh, you know, one of the podcasts I'll, I, I, I used to listen to more was, uh, was Rogan's podcast. And, and he would mention it almost, even though he never got into any really, uh, you know, big details about it, he would definitely get into the details that why aren't we talking about how to optimize our health? Yeah. So I just found it interesting that even, even then, you know, well, yeah. we, a lot of professions weren't allowed. I, I know ours, we were told specifically, you can't even talk about immune system support in relationship to COVID. So you, there was a lot of things that, that professions just weren't even allowed to do. Yeah. And, and also a lot of, a lot of doctors and a lot of um, allied health professions would have, they, they really, their license was being threatened if they said anything outside of what the official narrative was. And that also is what yeah, bothered a lot. That also is not what resonated with a lot of different healthcare professionals. So, you know, when they're ultimately their their main agenda is to try to make sure that they're helping their patients and keeping their patients safe, and then they're not allowed to say certain things that they really have seen for long periods of time be really supportive. And the literature is very sound for a lot of stuff, but because it was this new thing, they didn't want you to talk about any of it. So it became it became a real challenge for a lot of people. Yep. Something I just want to come back to really quickly on here was. When we were talking about the um, uh, mortality, yep. I was looking at just in Canada statistics, right? And so this is uh, Statista, uh, St Statista, and it was looking at number of deaths in Ontario, Canada from 2001 to 2020. So I was just looking at how it changed, right? And you mm -hmm. can see that generally there's a trend of sort of increasing mortality over, over the years, right? Mm -hmm. And particularly can, from kind of like 2015 up to 2020, it's kind of been actually quite steadily increasing. And yeah. so, so that was on Ontario. So this shows the statistics for Canada from 2001 to 2020. Yeah. And it basically shows that from 2000 up to 2020, there's been sort of a steady incline. And especially when you look at from about... 2016 to 2020, it's been really quite steadily increasing by about the same percentage. So the numbers here at three, 300,000 versus in 2019, 287, you know, so about 13,000 more that, that died in 2020. But that's not that much different from years before. If you look at sort of 2016 was 262, and 2017 was 274, so 12,000. And there wasn't necessarily anything going on at that time period. So this is another thing that confuses people when they look at all cause mortality, so total deaths, they often aren't seeing, and, and this is one I find confusing too, because depending on where you look at it, the numbers seem to be very different in different places. But initially when I saw, and there was initial research done at John Hopkins that got removed and retracted, but they were showing that there was virtually no difference in the overall death rates. Now, yes. so that's something that confuses people. And then the other thing that also we need to know about overall mortality is that even if there is an increase in death in, in say 2020 versus 2019, that doesn't mean that all of those extra deaths are only related to the actual viral infection causing death. It's often related to the entire pandemic response. So you gotta remember that some of the concerns people have around the measurements and the policy that's been taking in is that it doesn't take into account how much problems are happening from increases in suicide or increases in child abuse or spousal abuse, all of these different factors that are, that are dramatically affecting people's lives and also the death rate. This was, I wanna play this really quick. This was an article that came up. It said, in Japan, more people died from suicide last month than from COVID in all of 2020 and women have been most impacted. Mm. So let me just play this. In October, more Japanese died of suicide than from 10 months of COVID-19. Partly driven by suicide among women, which increased 80% from the previous year. They're suffering so much. They just feel it's better to die. Kokio Zura started a mental health hotline in March. 70% of the people asking for help are women. 
they lost their jobs, and they need to raise their kids, and they don't have any money, they attempt to suicide. His nonprofit receives about 200 messages a day. Koki says his 600 volunteers are not enough to keep up with the volume. And I have a message, um, accept messages like, I'm raping by father, by father, the realtor. Or my husband tried to kill me. Uh, yeah. Because of the pandemic. Because of the pandemic, yes. Um, before the pandemic, they had like a place that they can escape, like the schools or the, the office. Japan has long struggled with one of the highest suicide rates in the So it just gives you an idea of why also people have concerns around just the measures that are going on because it, it's far reaching. And so when people question, you know, or I think there was a massive rally that was in Montreal just the other day. So yep. uh, and there was one here in, in Victoria a little while ago too. And so when people are questioning that and they're wanting to end some of the measures, it, this is partly where it is. They're not being selfish or they're not being foolish necessarily. They, they have legitimate concerns because they've often stuff like this has touched them in some mm -hmm. way or yeah. they've seen it in another way. So they're seeing all of the other effects of this. So it's just, again, when people are saying things, I want people to understand there's, there's all these different pieces to it. And it's really important to be able to start to break that stuff down. And there, there really hasn't been that much emphasis on the, the repercussions of all this that much through, through mainstream media, for sure. Um, and like you said, I, you know, all these things, at the end of the day, you know, as humans, you know, our, our biggest asset is connection. You know, like we, we, we need connection with family. We need connection with people to, to drive us, to, to, to stimulate us, to, to, to live, you know, like, and, and we are being completely shut down from that. Uh, and you can see the repercussions with kids and, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I want to get started with, <laughs> with the kid thing, but, uh, yeah, it, uh, it's, well, we'll talk about that a little bit, maybe towards yeah. the end, just because this is where certain things are kind of, more and more measures are coming up and it's again where where people need to kind of under, feel where are they okay with things where are they not yeah. and what does that actually mean so but just so that it's like just to bring this up so that people can see where some of these different things are going on and why there's so much difference of opinion around stuff and so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm hoping people are starting to see the the trend here there's one jay i'm trying to see how i am like technologically uh impaired and uh <laughs> i gotta figure out how to bring this chart up there yeah there it is okay so this um just talking about like, how data can be just to tie in what you were talking about before so this is something i saw from ivor cummins and i heard quite a few interviews from him which was amazing i don't know if you want to play this or not but what they were doing here is as you can see they they have the deaths per million uh in sweden so just to give an example of a place that had uh, no measures versus what we've done. Uh, and then the world based and the, the scientific community was basically saying what you'd see here in yellow, okay, uh, was the prediction of where the deaths would be if Sweden did nothing. And what you see in blue is actually the actual deaths that happened. So if you look at, at, the, at the line, uh, you know, this is lower than some of the uh, past years from 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2015. So it's amazing how, you know, we can be convinced of something just, you know, because of, of what's being shown in the media. But when we actually look at what's actually happening, uh, it's, it's quite surprising. You, you would think that we would model ourselves after something that's, you know, maybe working or it'd be worth investigating. You know, so like yeah. you're saying, you know, to, to open up to that. Okay. Well, and, and Sweden's come up several times. I mean, I remember originally it was kind of like, oh, my God, what is Sweden doing? They're going to be a disaster. And, and it really showed out to be not really a disaster at all. And then it was actually coined for a while that that, may, that maybe should be the model that everybody starts to follow because 
they didn't lock everything down, right? And so they were a yeah. lot more open and it didn't send, tend to make the same difference. And a lot of people thought it was going to look more or less the same regardless of whether you did or didn't. I mean, I mean, viruses, I mean, all this stuff is very, very tricky to totally understand and predict, but generally you're not going to totally stop a virus for the most part, it will eventually, you really were initially, we were trying to stop the overloading of hospitals and ICUs. That was really the idea was kind of flatten the curve, right? Mm -hmm. The curve got flattened fairly early on and has never come back up. But then it sort of moved to looking at positive cases, right? Which is very different than looking at death rate and, and which hasn't really changed much or has kind of come down a little bit. So, That's right. So it yeah, didn't. when you see those all cause mortality at the end of the year, that's where a lot of confusion has come up for people too. And, and different studies show different things. I think from what I've learned from it is it's hard to know exactly what it is. It's probably what we'll see that more and more over the next year. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of information like that that's come out too, that yeah. sort of says, okay, well, how is that possible? How can you have the worst pandemic that we've ever seen and at the same time not see the dramatic changes in all cause mortality that we would have expected so that's right and, and I, that it, might it, come out even in more detail within the next year like sometimes i know that information is hard to gather everything but yes i've seen that same same one and i've been following some of the stuff for sweden and it, it seems like to me they're on the right track right oh that Oh, so here it is. This, I was trying to look for the other uh, Dr. Malcolm Kendrick uh, and um, and Ira Cummins had, did a great podcast um, on looking at data. And the, the, so for those of you that don't know, Ira Cummins, is, that's what he did for a living was analyze data for government to create mm -hmm. health policy and stuff like that, amongst many other things. But And they were looking at, you know, the effects of... Uh, and he's the first one to say, just like you said before, Jay, you know, like in the beginning when there was that sense of urgency, he said, you know what, I, I could understand why we would take a position to flatten the curve and okay, maybe a couple of weeks makes sense to kind of get a stranglehold on this so that, you know, maybe there's no uh, excessive overrunning of the hospitals and things like that. Yeah. So goes, but then they started looking at the impact of the measures whether it be masking to, and he gets into that, which is, is they're, they're, it's a very interesting discussion on showing, looking clearly at data and when the implementation, implementation of these lockdowns were, when the masking was done and was there any change in the data? Uh, and apparently not. Yeah. Well, so, and, and, and when you start to really get into it and you look at data, it's like you need to see if things are done as a relative risk versus an absolute risk reduction. And there, it's completely different. And yeah. almost everything that we see in, in media and almost every study shows relative risk reduction, which shows massive numbers. That's when you see like, oh, like 95% or 50% changes in this or that. And it makes people think, oh my gosh, like, why would I not do that? But when you actually break it down to absolute risk reduction, which is very different, that's a whole other topic to get into. And I might do an episode on that just to break it down for people. But I mean, it can literally be the difference between like a, you know, 50% benefit from something looking at from relative risk versus really more like maybe a 0.1% improvement when you look at it from an absolute risk. Like it's completely different. And informed consent was supposed to be done by looking at absolute risk reduction. And so we don't use that because it's not sexy. The numbers don't look good. And we can inflate what, what, what per is perceived as being much more beneficial than it actually is when we use things from a relative risk reduction point of view. Right. So when we look at some of the stuff with vitamin D, and you'll see this also in, in other literature, like, you know, when you really look at a lot of times things are much less effective than we think they are based on the numbers. And you'll see this in vitamin studies and all sorts of things too. But it's kind of like if you're going to talk about it and say, use relative risk, then you should be using all the other stuff too that is showing similar benefits. And so when we look at some of the nutrients that we were talking about, I'd say some of the biggest ones that we would talk about would be vitamin D, vitamin C, and then like an omega-3 to 6 ratio. Those are probably some of the big ones. And the vitamin D, I mean, like I said, had been shown to really reduce symptom severity, which results in less hospitalizations, ICU use, um, death, and it also can, it's also been shown to reduce infection and infection time. So that's really important. And they're still not implementing it. 
And it seems, it seems staggering because what they've actually also found is that the population that is having the most severe reactions to the, the virus is the population that is already insufficient or deficient in vitamin D. So then it starts to wonder like, why are we not making mandatory testing for vitamin D? So essential because we already know and we've seen studies that show what it can do. Why is that not on the table? Why is nobody talking about it? That's one of the questions that people start to ask again, and it, and it raises more controversy for people because they're like, well, why wouldn't that if we know that? And that's not just me talking about it. Again, there was a, a, huge, open... a huge cost benefit to doing that too. With the, like you're uh, mentioning the, the, the repercussions of lowering some of the symptoms to 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 decreasing people going into the hospital to decreasing the length of 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 all the symptoms arising like that that's massive and so a lot of the a lot of doctors now actually doctors and scientists started to sign a petition um trying to persuade government to start to use vitamin d to combat COVID 19 and yeah. this has over 200 different scientists and doctors signatures on it and as they break it down here, evidence to date suggests the possibility that COVID-19 pandemic sustains itself in large part through infection of those with low vitamin D and the deaths are concentrated largely in those with deficiency. And that was actually also saw, seen with low vitamin C again too. Yep. And um, the preponderance of evidence indicates that increased vitamin D would help reduce infection, hospitalizations, ICU submissions, and deaths. And they kind of break it down again that because vitamin D is such such low risk, that toxicity would be extremely rare with the recommendations that they're making, that it really makes no sense as to why they don't start. And they said there is no need to wait for further clinical trials to increase use of something so safe, especially when remedying high rates of deficiency insufficiency should already be a priority. Exactly. Um, if, right. It should you know, be it and, should be there in the first place, even regardless of COVID. Uh, exactly. It's one of the things that functional medicine doctors are looking at regularly because they know how important it is. So that's something that came up there around vitamin D. And then, then you look at vitamin C, also, also articles right away in studies on vitamin C and adjunctive therapy for respiratory infections, sepsis and COVID-19. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can pull up these studies and take a look at them, but um, given the favorable safety profile and low cost of vitamin C and the frequency of vitamin C deficiency in respiratory infections, it may be worthwhile testing patients within C status and treating accordingly. So they actually found through here that um, vitamin C deficiency in respiratory infections, including COVID-19, this is sort of a big literature review, and the mechanism of action they talk about and they basically find that the evidence to date indicates that oral vitamin C of two to eight grams may reduce the incidence and duration of respiratory infections and intravenous vitamin C six to 24 has been shown to reduce mortality, intensive care unit and hospital stays and time or on mechanical ventilation for severe respiratory infections. So again, something that is so safe yeah. and that's been studied is not being talked about. And so right. again, this is why people start to wonder what is going on and it doesn't make sense to them. Which can be easily implemented like right away. And there's no like half having to wait for anything, you know, <laughs> like you could, I, and, and case in point, I think, I don't know about you, but even us recommending this to, 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 to people, um, we started noticing that there was a, a shortage. Oh, vitamin, very much. Of yeah. vitamin D, you know, so there yeah. was some, you know, obviously it, well, it, it definitely it definitely started getting out. People were talking about it, but it was just it was just a funny situation. It's like people started talking about it, and then right away they were getting slammed. You know, yeah. it's like how would dare you tell people to take this that that's going to protect them from from a virus? You know, you need a, a basically a strong medication to protect yourself from that. And again, it comes back to the whole concept of germ and terrain theory, and and you know most functional medicine doctors or integrated medicine doctors, and a lot of well, I would say most of the medical doctors that are aware of it practice more of a functional or integrative approach. They're aware of how important these things are. I mean, these are at the foundation. I mean, you just got to think about it in general. Does it make sense that what you eat, what you drink, your nutritional level, all of these things will probably play a role in how well your body works? I mean, that's what they are. They're essentially cofactors in the smooth running of just about every biochemical reaction that we've got in our body. And... Um, so again, that stuff is there to look at. 
And yeah. I think the other one I talked about was an omega-3, omega-6 ratio. So those are your fatty acids. They play a big role in mitigating inflammation. I used to test people all the time, but I kind of find I don't even test anybody now because everybody's out of balance with it. You know, you should be like a, around a three to one ratio of six to three. Most people are 10 times out of balance on that or much more. And so almost everybody needs to incorporate clean freshwater fish or some sort of a of an omega-3 supplementation to support that cascade of inflammation. Right. And when they're out of balance, it increases the risk. And that was also done right there too. So blood omega-3, fatty acids, and death from COVID-19, a pilot study, basically showed that COVID-19 was lower in those with the highest um, omega-3 levels. So needs all of these things would benefit from having more studies on it. But again, it's, re you know, it's relatively new. These are new studies coming up as the information is showing based on what we are aware of and makes sense, right? What makes mm -hmm. sense, just common sense, and what makes sense in the literature already of what we know how these, the mechanism of action is for some of these things. But again, none of them are being talked about very much. Yeah, nothing in regards to optimization of health, right? So like you said, if we look at a full spectrum, you know, you will have those, um, whether it's vitamin D, vitamin C, all these things that we could supplement with the diet. Uh, but then we're looking at, you know, like exercise and, and stress management and, and things like this that, you know, are, it's kind of hard not to be stressed when you're constantly being bombarded by, <laughs> you know, so yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's trying to incorporate all of them. And so I think yeah. of them all like logs in the fire, you know, it's like the, the more logs you can pull out, the fire just goes down and there's less chance. And I did an episode called building resilience and I kind of get into a lot of this stuff. And um, it's really kind of looking at how do you just build a healthy system overall so they're just less susceptible to problems and a lot of that's real fundamental stuff now the problem is when people are not already there where do you start and sometimes that's where you need sometimes stronger medications and different things that will have a stronger effect while you're still doing the preventative stuff like yeah. getting everybody's levels and optimal zones for vitamin c and vitamin d is really beneficial and then you talked about earlier this is where some of the other controversy came up was around some of the alternative therapies that doctors were using, like the hydroxychloroquine. Yep. And um, I mean, that was a really interesting one because the, I mean, that came up America, America's frontline doctors is another website that you can look at. It's been taken out. It's, it's MDs from all in the States. I and mean, there's a lot of yeah. MDs talking about stuff from there and putting out protocols on how to use. And they've actually got specific protocols on how much vitamin C, D, quercetin, zinc that you should be using to support the immune system. And they also talked a lot about hydroxychloroquine, right? I mean, and I'm a part of a group where I hear doctors all over the world and a lot of them were talking about how effective that was for their patients and how upset they were that they actually pulled it. And so, I'm just going to pull up here. So if we look at that, you know, again, it was kind of like the PCR testing, the studies on it. So hydroxychloroquine is, is an over-the-counter medication, non-prescriptive medications in many places in the world because yeah. it's got such a high safety profile. So yeah. then all of a sudden they're using it, which, which they were finding really good results with. And then they were basically told to pull it because it was not safe. And so when you look at it, it says, in spite of the drug's proven safety problem, in most countries, it's available without a prescription. Several studies, including the solidarity um, trial led by the World Health Organization, using toxic doses to, too late in the disease process or in the disease progress, claim that the drug was too dangerous to treat people at risk of dying from COVID-19. And one of those studies was retracted within two days after publication, the Lancet due to unverifi unverifiable database. But again, they had already made the recommendations to pull it. So yeah. it says like the World Health Organization and a number of national governments had changed their COVID-19 policies and treatments on the basis of that one flawed study. And then they That's never right. went back with new information. This again is why people don't get it. So when you're only hearing certain things, these are questions that people need answers to because there's not good answers to them. And it was almost like brilliant at the time too, you know, not, not to get into politics, but uh, you know, at the same time, Trump is saying that this is an effective procedure and that 
obviously swayed a lot of people to not believing anything just because it was Trump. Yeah. Uh, so it was, yeah, they, I mean, it's, very, it's like where it's coming from um, says a lot for people depending on, yeah. on sort of who they believe. It's like wherever the information is coming from, but in many ways, when he was saying that from my perspective, I was like, that's what I'd been reading and why I'd been hearing from many yeah. different doctors in, in part of this group. And, um, and I was surprised when it got pulled because I, I knew it had such a big safety profile. So, um, but that's one of the things why people start to not understand. And the other one that the frontline doctors talk about a lot is the, um, the anti-parasitic me uh, medication called ivermectin. ivermectin. And, and this was another big one, again, that's not being used. And again, check out the frontline uh, doctors. They talk about that specifically. And... Uh, Dr. Pierre Corey, who's the president of the Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance, he, uh, he had a testimony to the Senate basically pleading for the swift review of the already expansive and rapidly emerging medical evidence on ivermectin, which he claims has a near 100% efficacy rate for both prevention and the treatment of patients with, with severe COVID-19. And... Um, you know, and then that was disputed by the Associate Press, but then quickly rectified again to show that it actually was true and that there should be much more looking into ivermectin. So yeah. a lot of these doctors that are, were, are able to use it, use it. But again, none of this stuff is being put out there. All There's very little funding going to any of the other potential treatments. And all of the funding has kind of gone to the, the vaccine research. And this again right. is what bothers yeah. people because there's they're seeing clinically things that are saving lives and making a dramatic impact, and yet they're being told they can't use it. That's right. So that that in itself, you know, is 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 interesting because you you'd think that what, why wouldn't we investigate things that could be of great uh, significance and in, uh, in helping in the overall kind of control of something uh, and optimization of the person. So. Uh, yeah, that, that, that in itself, you know, should make people look a little bit deeper on things for sure. And there's like an abundance of that. Like it, it uh, and you, you could pull up some very legitimate people and see like just even on social media that of, of how them being pulled off social media to being silenced to, it, it is uh, very concerning, uh, especially when you're seeing the, the level of person that's being silenced. It's, uh, it's shocking. Yeah. Well, here's, here's just on that one. Um, this is the key to defeating COVID-19 already exists. We need to start using it. Harvey Reich, MD, PhD, professor of epidemiology at Yale. And he says specifically, fortunately, the situation can be reversed easily and quickly. I'm referring, of course, to the medication hydroxychloroquine. And he goes through the whole reason as to why we should be incorporating it. So mm. again, you hear different people that are in the know, very intelligent, held in prestigious positions that have very different opinions to what's currently going on. This is partly why, this is yeah. again, why people have a lot of different viewpoints on what's going on. And if something inside them doesn't resonate with what's going on, and then they're seeing it backed up by this type of literature, it's going to create, this, this is where you're going to start to get stronger and stronger opinions. And if they're not being talked about openly and transparent, that's what creates this big polarization. People then start to not trust what government is telling them because they're hearing such different a thing by people that they trust. Or, or on the other side of things, it, it, it pushes people into this state of, of more confusion, more fear. And then all they're yeah. looking for is just a simple answer that, you know, often can be the wrong one. So, you know, well, and on that point too, what happens yeah. is when we get really confused, yep. then we don't know what to do. And then we actually more and more look for a savior to fix something for us. We actually give our power away to somebody else or to something else to make that decision for us because we just don't know. That's and, right. and a part that Kevin and I talk about a lot is around this idea of, again, getting back into what feels right for you and then starting to look at stuff. And, and as tricky as it is, I mean, you're not necessarily going to go through all of this type of information yourself, and it's hard to understand, but you can start to look for other venues that are sharing certain information that resonates with you and can be backed up. Like the stuff that we're sharing with you right now, this is all... So yep. regular mainstream kind of stuff yeah. is just showing what is probably not so aware of. 
So I'll read the critical question that comes up around this one. So the critical question that begs for answers, why did doctors not feel financially or otherwise supported in their search for effective COVID-19 prevention and treatments? How does the funding they receive compare to vaccine research? How did a ma majorly flawed study get through the Lancet's peer review? Why are certain parties intel intentionally censoring and blocking safe and effective low cost treatment options? So these are all questions that I think are absolutely warranted to ask. And unless those get really solid answers that make sense to you and feel right, people are gonna look for more and more reasons as to what else might be going on. That's uh -huh. just the nature. And I, and I feel like we should be keep questioning if you're not getting a good answer. And, and, have, like, and have healthy debate on it. You know? like the, absolutely. The, the, I would love to wrong. see some really great debates with some of these different groups that talk about stuff to sit down and pose them and get really clear answers on some of the stuff. That would be so important for everybody because it mm. would clear the air on certain things. But, um, but that it doesn't may, happen. You know what it makes me think of it. It's funny that just uh, through some of the the stuff we subscribe to and everything else too. There there are a few things that come in from uh, from France, and uh, it's it's actually impressive how much they debate each other. Uh, not to say that there's no censorship or anything like that, but they um, seem to be a lot more outspoken in challenging, especially in the 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 medical uh, uh, domain, because. Uh, watching a few things and, and reading several articles on that front uh, was was just quite impressive on how much there's there's some backlash on it now whether or not that has an impact I you know it, it's questionable but, but uh, are yeah, they getting it, some debates where they're actually able to pose some of these types of questions and get a a solid answer back have you heard anything like that where they've really been able no. to get something that sort of puts some of your thoughts, like to me, it, it's like some of those ones I just don't, I've never heard a great answer yet. The, the whole thing around the PCR test, mm -hmm. that really, I would love to get some really solid understanding around that because most of the stuff I've heard makes no sense to me. Well, and, and you know, rightly so, because it, it, you would think something like that is, is either it is or it isn't. It, there's no gray zone. <laughs> and it seems like we're sitting in a gray zone where, yeah, uh, we we ha how could it how could it have gone on this long, and there's still no real answer other than that's just what we're doing. Yeah, that that that's. So, yeah. on that note, then let's move yeah. to probably the one that I think is probably the biggest one that people are wondering about right now, mm -hmm. and that's looking at the intervention of the um, of the shot. Okay. Good choice. Good choice of words. So I've had lots of people asking me about this and I would yeah. say this is probably the main narrative that I hear from people when they are thinking about getting the medical intervention in the arm. Yeah. So they believe that it's the right thing to do because they're wanting to create herd immunity and they're wanting to protect the ones that are most vulnerable. That is essentially the main narrative, I would say, yeah. for the, most of the people that I've talked to. And, and then you've also got the people that are just really scared of getting it and they want to make sure that they, they, they get the intervention so that they're not going to get the virus, right? Yeah. Which is all the reasons that ultimately we would have Makes an sense. intervention like that to begin with. That's kind of what we're used to thinking about with this type of intervention. Yep. And so... Let's try and break some of this down. So we'll look at, and I'm just going to call it the V, just just for purposes of trying not to be um, censored if we yep. aren't already getting censored, uh, talking about some of this stuff that's just outside of what the conventional narrative is and trying to bring some awareness to some of these things. Mm -hmm. So let's look at it first. So this was approved for emergency use in December, 2020. So emergency use is gonna be different than what normally the types of trials they would have to go through. Okay. Right. The, re so, the regular process that, I, yeah. Exactly. So whenever we've talked about these in the past, they have to go through a certain period of time. They have to go through certain types of studies. They have to have a certain length of time to really evaluate long-term benefits and risks and, and all of this stuff. And so mm -hmm. essentially this, this V has not had the chance to do that because it was pushed through so quickly because of this, um, the emergency use that it was approved for. 
Mm -hmm. So that's one of the big things that concerns people. Okay. The other thing to think about is that this study was also 100% funded by the company that makes it and has everything to gain from selling it. That's another point of contention for people. And that would, that would be a conflict of interest on any study when you're looking at it. When you're trying to evaluate a study, that would be one of the things you're looking is who's funding the study. And I remember looking at a Cochrane Review Board, which is a, basically one of the gold standards for looking at, at different in, at, at studies. And they looked at a whole bunch of information looking at the flu vaccine. Yep. And what they basically found was that the interventions or the studies that were supported and, um, and paid for by big industry, aka the, the companies that were making them, all showed to be quite beneficial. And the companies that were on, the, on all of the research or a lot of the research that was done by more institutions that weren't funded by um, big industry showed very moderate to no levels of benefit to them. So again, these are why you get so much misinformation or, or just different information to try and figure out. And people are going to resonate with different pieces of it, depending on how the stuff sits with them in the first place. And, um, and one thing I've learned with stats is you can prove or disprove anything with statistics, depending on how you want to play with them. Mm -hmm. So talking about statistics, let's go to the actual study. So let's talk about the Pfizer uh, BioNTech vaccine study where they did 95% efficacy. So that's what people hear is 95% efficacy. So I think the first question that I remember Dr. Eric Rifkin telling me is that whenever you hear 90, whenever you hear big numbers like 95% efficacy or you know 50% efficacy or whatever it might be, the first thing he says is it means absolutely nothing until you know what are you actually talking about. So the number itself means almost nothing. And so First, then you have to kind of take a look at it. So what are they actually talking about? So what did they actually test for? Yeah. Now, this, I would go to the study and actually look at it. And there'll be links in the study in the article here that I'll have posted. You can go and check, take a look at it yourself and go through it. But essentially, the study was looking at people that already had COVID-19. So it was the you actually had to have the symptoms based on symptoms and a pcr test that's what they were looking at yeah it's so, like one or two symptoms right yeah so you had to have and so things to kind of capture from this too is that the study the participants in the study only had mild symptoms for the most part some moderate to mild symptoms but there was no severe symptoms and there were no deaths so they have no information about whether it decreases the risk of severe symptoms or death. They can't say that because that was not part of the criteria within the study. What the study was essentially testing was looking at the end of it. Did the people that had the intervention, the V, did they have less symptoms of COVID-19 syndrome, the condition that is called COVID-19, which is very different than the actual virus. They're two different things. Mm -hmm. So they looked at, did the people that had the intervention have less symptoms than the people that did not, that had a placebo? And what they found was that there was a relative risk reduction of 95%. So that sounds like a lot of stuff, but if we break down what it's actually telling you is all the study can really say is that if you get the intervention, there's a relative risk reduction, which is very, very different than an absolute risk reduction. Yep telling you that you may have less severe symptoms in a population that no one died from and no one had severe infections or no one had severe symptoms from. So all I can really tell you at best is that it may decrease some of the symptoms if you already have it. Nothing in the study talks about immunity, talks about actually immunity from the virus right. or talks about transmission of the virus. None of that's been studied. So they cannot say that it will prevent you from getting the virus. And it does not tell you whether or not you can, it will stop transmission, which is why when you listen to anything, they talk about it. If you get it, nothing really changes. Uh -huh. You still have to social distance. You still have to wear a mask. You still have to uh, lock down, like nothing really changes. And so this is a big 
controversy for people. It doesn't make sense. When, when people are questioning the V, they are not being selfish. They are not being ignorant. Most of the time they've looked into it and there's mm -hmm. information that doesn't make sense to them. And you got to remember, this is a experimental new technology right. that has no long-term studies. So mm -hmm. you really don't know what potentially could happen with any of it. I mean, that's, that's an absolute fact. You just do not know. So yeah. when people start to question around it, they, they really, they're, they've got every right to question about it. And Absolutely. I just want to show here, um, COVID-19 vaccine protocols reveal that trials are designed to succeed. And so when they break it down again, so I just want to look at here. So prevention of infection is not a criterion for success of any of these vaccines. And that's actually looking at the Pfizer and Moderna and the AstraZeneca. All Which oddly enough is what's being talked about the most in the media. Well, right? we, we often talk about the importance of developing herd immunity. And, and that's, that's, that's right. something that it absolutely makes sense. But when they're talking about that and then they're showing what's actually been tested, they they don't coincide because that was never a criterion. It wasn't designed to do that. All it was designed to do was see if it decreases the symptoms. And so right. as they talk about here, in fact, their endpoints all require confirmed infections and all of those, and all those they will include in the analysis for success, the only difference being the severity of symptoms between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. So measuring differences amongst only those infected by SARS-CoV-2 underscores the implicit conclusion that the vaccines are not expected to prevent infection, only modify symptoms of those infected. We all expect an effective vaccine to prevent serious illness if infected. Three of the vaccine protocols, Moderna, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, do not require that their vaccine prevent serious disease, only that they prevent moderate symptoms, which may be as mild as a cough or a headache. So right. when people get up in arms about making sure everybody goes and gets this and starts to shame people that aren't, I really feel like they just don't have all the information. Because if they knew all of that, why... My, under, my, my question I just keep coming back to is I'm, I'm trying to understand where the benefit at this point lies. There, there needs to still be a lot more information to show that it's going to actually stop transmission and whatnot if it was going to be a yeah, be, safe yeah, I, option. That's right. Which, you know, if, if, if it was the case, uh, and, and again, we got to look at the other side of the coin is the, the, the elephant in the room is the, 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 what's the risk if you don't? Yeah. So what numbers are we looking at? What are we, what are we risking potentially taking something that is to prevent uh, the, the, the virus from, from affecting us, uh, which is at a 99.98, depending on which age group you're in, uh, you know, a potential of, of being completely fine. Not to say that, you know, it hasn't affected people. Of course it has. Uh, but I'm just saying, we're, at what point uh, is the risk versus reward uh, there? You know, like it, it, and it makes sense to question things like this. This is your body. This is, you know, if, if something is shown through proper research to show its effectiveness, well, then it makes, makes sense to, to kind of consider it. Um, but all these questions like Jay's saying of, of looking at this, this is a, a great uh, one that Jay pulled up because it, it really shows that the studies wasn't designed for that. Uh, and, but that's the message that's going out is, is such is that it, it will create immunity. And that's why I'm getting it is to protect people around me and, and myself from, from getting this. Right. Well, and this is where wording plays into stuff. When you hear mm -hmm. something like 90, 95% effective. So it's not a lie because they're using certain numbers that they are, that they can back up, but they're not yep. going into the details of what that actually means for people. People just assume that that number means something for them. That is, basically people assume that that means there's only a 5% risk that they're going to actually get it if they have this intervention. And that's not, that's not true at all. That's not what was studied. Right. So it's, it's sort of this, you know, it's like that, that bikini thing I said at the beginning around stats, you know, it's like, what is not, 
shown is vital. And so what we're trying to bring awareness to is that there's, there's more going on, there's more information around this in order for you to make a truly informed consent because these are important decisions. And the concerns, like they said, safety, rare and long-term side effects, adverse events. So like Kevin had just brought up, so first the study is not large enough to detect less common adverse events, reliability. Mm -hmm. And the placebo group will not be continued beyond 3.5 months for ethical reasons. So they will have no data past three and a half months. That's it. So okay. if you're talking about giving someone like a child this intervention that has no, no literature to support what's good, no knowledge whatsoever, what's going to happen past about three and a half months. I mean, that, that would be concerning because especially when we look at some of the adverse reactions that we do know, some of the adverse reactions that are potentials are permanent disability, severe allergic reactions, anaphylaxis, death. There's been talk about infertility. There's been talk about um, autoimmunity. So, it's a big difference between giving this to someone that's maybe 85 and someone that's maybe 16. Mm -hmm. There's a long range of potential side effects for something that we really don't know anything past about three and a half months. And I think that's the great thing to highlight is that we really don't know. So that, that, that's the concerning thing is, is uh, you would think that this would be a huge criteria <laughs> in, in implementing something. Well, um, especially with the risk of what they're trying to prevent. So Absolutely. Like and, and it's, and again, it's like, it's the, it's the lack of transparency that, that frustrates people and makes people think that something else, there's a different agenda because when they don't, when they're not transparent with it, you know, think about it this way. If you were with your partner and they were coming back late or they had different reasons that they weren't coming home or doing something and the explanation they gave you didn't really answer your questions, would you just be totally okay with that and let it go? <laughs> or would you start to maybe question things a little bit more and try and get a better understanding of what's actually going on, especially if it's something in your gut is not feeling good about it? Yeah. Right. That's, that's how we have to kind of think about all of this stuff. It's like, take it to a personal one-on-one -on -one situation on when your gut tells you stuff and how you would want to naturally learn more about what's going on to appease that sensation. And if you're not getting good answers, it usually causes more of that sensation to build up. And that's what's kind of going on in a global scale right now is there's more of that feeling coming up because as more and more stuff comes out, we're, we're seeing lots of discrepancies and lack of transparency. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be what stirs people up around stuff. So yeah. I'll show you um, this article here. So this was the other thing to think about with this that was also not talked about. And so this is... Um, the uh, International Journal of Clinical Practice, informed consent disclosure to vaccine trials subjects the risk to COVID-19 vaccines worsening clinical disease. Now, this is really important. So COVID-19 vaccines designed to elicit neutralizing antibodies may sensitize vaccine recipients to more severe disease than if they were not vaccinated. Vaccines for SARS, MERS, RSV have never been approved and the data generated in the development of the testing of these vaccines suggest a serious mechanistic concern that vaccines designed empirically using the traditional approach consisting of the unmodified or minimally modified coronavirus viral spike to elicit the neutralizing antibodies, be they composed of protein, viral vector, DNA, or RNA, and irrespective of delivery method, may worsen COVID-19 disease via antibody-dependent enhancement, this ADE. Yeah. And yeah. this is, I remember an article coming out by a, um, uh, a I think it was a, it was a cardiologist or a cardiac surgeon who was, who was very pro-vaccine, the population, but he had very severe, he had very big warnings against the elderly population, particularly that could react to this ADE, where they could actually have a very severe reaction. So- Like they showed with the H1N1. Right. And so this risk is sufficiently obscured in the clinical trial protocols and consent forms for ongoing COVID-19 vaccine trials that at adequate patient comprehension of this risk is unlikely to occur, obviating truly informed consent by subjects in these trials. So people aren't aware that this is even a, a potential. 
And then the conclusion, the specific and significant COVID-19 risk of ADE should have been and should be prominently and independently disclosed to research subjects currently in vaccine trials, as well as those being recruited for the trials and future patients after vaccine approval in order to meet the medical ethics standard of patient comprehension for informed consent. So that's a really important one. That's <laughs> it's exciting. a really important one. Yeah. You know, and um, this is another one here. Imperfect vaccination can enhance the transmission of highly virulent pathogens. This is the other concern with vaccines is that they themselves can actually set the stage for more virulent strains to develop. So our data shows that anti-disease vaccines that do not prevent transmission, which we know this vaccine has not been shown to prevent transmission, can create conditions that promote the emergence of pathogen strains that cause more severe disease in unvaccinated hosts. Mm. So kind of, kind of the opposite of what we're looking for. From these studies, yeah. And so as much as you're gonna hear studies telling you something different, there's also lots of stuff showing something else. So again, coming back to what we originally talked about, why we're bringing and presenting some of this stuff is to basically give people an overall idea of what is being presented, what maybe you're not aware of, what you can look in more yourself and learn more about before you make really big decisions around things based on a limited amount of information that maybe you think to be totally true without knowing the whole picture. Because like if anything, this type of intervention is such an emotional decision for a lot of people and we get very yep. strong ideas of it. And mm -hmm. this is not about pro or anti or anything like that. It's, it's really about informed consent and, and then choice. And so the only way you can really make a appropriate choice is by knowing as much of the information as you can, sifting right. through it, and then seeing what ultimately resonates for you and where your degree of risk warrants it, right? Yeah, Based on your individuality. For some people, if that still makes sense to them, then that's what they're going to do. And if that feels right for you, then that's what feels right for you. For other people, if it doesn't, then they got to factor that in. But you got to remember, it's very different depending on your age, on yeah. your, I mean, when you start to break down, well, the age, the risk in, in age, you know, like the, the, that, that right there to me is, you know, should be something that people put into the equation of, okay, so let's say I don't do any of this. Uh, what is my risk of getting the virus of uh, getting through it and being completely fine? So if you look at that percentage versus, which we could pull up those numbers, but uh, if you look at that percentage versus uh, taking something that we don't know much about yet, uh, and um, you know, I'm not sure how much time is going to have to go by <laughs> till we really actually get data on that because they're going to stop. Yeah, you know, there's certain data that they're not going to not going to get. Like you said, in that study, they're going to stop after three and a half months. Right. So what, and this is where I think some of the concern is, is in that one article that I pulled up where it was talking about um, the uh, enhancement of the transmission of highly virulent pathogens. Yeah. Part of what happens is because there's no, and also when you don't have a placebo group that's going long-term, you've got no comparison. You can't compare the the intervention versus the non-intervention after three and a half months. So then everything starts to get mixed together. You don't actually know then what is causing what. So when we talk about even more virulent strains, how much of that could be potentially being caused because of what is going on? If we don't have the groups that are um, not being vaccinated versus the ones that are, then it's hard to know what, what side effects are coming up that are related to the vaccine or are not related to it, or what's related to a more virulent strain or not. We just have no data. So it gets to become really difficult to try and understand what's going on down the road. And so the critical question they ask here is, is it responsible and necessary to subject the entire young, healthy and working population with a low risk of dying from COVID-19 to experimental vaccines of which the effects on autoimmunity and fertility are yet unknown? Mm. Or are there other ways to protect our elderly? Right. And that's where it gets into all the other stuff that we've talked about. And ultimately, what everybody's wanting is, how do you ultimately 
protect yourself and your loved ones. And that's what it always comes down to. And what we're trying to present is just, there may be other options and the option that everybody is kind of hoping on may not be what we all think it is. And there needs to still be a lot more information coming down the road to really understand what's going on. And, you know, from my point of view, um, I know personally, I would be hesitant to do an intervention that I don't know more about that has potential risk, especially if I'm not at a very high risk to begin with. Yeah, right. And I guess the argument to that just to, would, would, that I've heard tons about is that, well, then what about the people that are at risk? Um, but again, you know, there, there are things we should be emphasizing for the people that are at risk to change in order to decrease their risk. So I, I understand that there are certain ones that are maybe in a position where that's not possible. Uh, but I just, you know, I've said this to many people just to, to kind of have a discussion about it. And when they, people question things like that, I, and especially with what's going on now is to put things into perspective and say, well, listen, two years ago uh, or three years ago or 10 years ago, when, when the flu's around, when all these things, you know, when there, there were other viruses and have always been other viruses that have been around, how, how come no one was concerned then about the number of people with comorbidities uh, dying because of complications due to, to a virus? Um, you know, all of a sudden that it's become, you know, under the loop, uh, under the microscope, you know, we, a lot more people are concerned and, and it's become a big, a big subject. But uh, I think it's crucial to, again, do what you said, you know, put things under, into perspective, um, really take the time, like you said, to make a sound decision more uh, when your frame, frame of mind also isn't stuck in that fear mode, uh, because that's when we can make decisions that don't quite make sense and or aren't the best for, for our situation. Well, most of the times, if you kind of go back in your own life and you think about the times you made um, quick or harsh decisions based on strong emotions when that were tied in with like worry, fear, stress, they're usually not the best decisions that we can make. And in my, I'm not telling anybody to do this or that. I just want people to understand bigger picture. And then from their, their point of view, what makes sense for them based on where they are, what makes sense for their family? Because, and, and even when you were talking about what about the people that are more at risk? Well, absolutely. I think that's, that's what it, most of it revolves around is how do you protect those people? But if we go back to looking at what the study actually showed, it didn't show anything about that. What it showed right. was that it might have a mild to moderate lowering of the symptoms, but it did nothing to show about whether it stopped transmission or that it stopped you from even necessarily getting the virus itself. That we may find more out down the road as they do more studies on it and, and sort of investigate yeah. it. But at this point, we just don't know. And yeah. what we do know is that there's a lot we don't know and there is certain potential risks that are very real. And so yeah. people need to be able to look at those things and say, based on what we know right now, does that make sense? Am I comfortable with it, given all of these other things? That's right. And, um, and there is lots of stuff that has been showing up. So when you pull up here, this is the National Vaccine Information Center. And this, as of February, found, no, sorry, this is... Uh, March 5th. So yeah. found 31,079 cases were COVID-19 and it breaks down kind of what these different percentages were. And so mm -hmm. it just gives an idea that there are. So 1,524 as of that date had died from it. Um, permanent disability, office visits, emergency room, emergency room doctor, hospitalizations. It kind of goes through some of the big things that have come up with it. Mm -hmm. And you got to remember like also a lot of people that actually like this is this is when you look at the when people actually re report vaccine injuries i mean it's estimated it's about one percent of the population that has symptoms actually report symptoms a lot of people talk about them and have them but they don't always report them for documentation so That's again right. this just shows what's being reported but it's a lot of what's we don't know so again these are the things to consider when before you're making um, decisions that could affect yourself or your family. Absolutely. 
Yeah, it's uh, that's crucial to remember because there there are so many components that we don't know. So if you know the more someone tries to make a, a decision based on <laughs> on a certain information that is available, and it's kind of hard, like we've shown today, uh, to to decipher through what's real and what's not. So you got to again come back to you know looking at you know I wanted to mention that before you know like it, it we didn't. Well, we kind of touched this because we've been showing that science, you know, can be manipulated is, either way. It can, it can in, in any way. Right. So you can make numbers look like anything if, if they're presented in such a fashion. So then it's to kind of, you know, look at it and see what makes more sense for you. But, and hopefully we can provide some, some insight on that so that people can start, you know, to make better decisions for sure. Yeah. And I'll, I'll finish this up with just the last critical question that comes up at the end of this is, yeah. so the critical question that needs clarification in order to combat conspiracy theories is, why is mass vaccination promoted as the ultimate solution to the pandemic and favored over other important parts of the solution? Considering that evidence supporting mass vaccination is inconclusive, while evidence regarding other prevention and treatments is building, and the cost of mass vaccination program is far greater than the use of existing medications. Mm. Why is there talk about potentially mandating vaccines, but, for, but not, for example, proof of vitamin D status? And I mean, these are all really good questions to ask, um, especially given what we know and what's been shown. So yep. again, one more time for people, if you are hearing people talk about stuff from a different perspective, this is likely why you're hearing very polarized views. It depends on what people are aware of and what they're listening to and what they've been informed with. And yep. what I liked about this article is she's got, did a really great job with backing everything up. It's got all of the documents in it. And I think it's a really important one to take your time and go through and you can read the whole article. We just kind of touched on it and uh, I'm, I'm actually going to look to trying to connect with her to do a, an interview with her because I, I would like to get her point of view on where things are right at the moment too. Yeah. But Kevin and I had just been chatting about this back and forth and we wanted to share some information and kind of get out and, um, and just talk to you about some of the concerns that we've got because ultimately we just feel that, it's really important to share information because when we talk to people and a lot of people don't know all of the other pieces, it's, it actually concerns me. I get very concerned for my patients. I get concerned for yeah. certain people that they're going to make decisions before they know all of the information. And, and um, you know, in my gut, that makes me concerned. And so when that starts to happen after a while, you feel like you need to do something. And so Kevin and I have been Absolutely. talking about and decided let's try and pull together what makes sense to us and see if that helps people. None of this is meant to confuse people more or make them upset. It's to try and just create more information, more informed consent before you make choices. And, and also to try and decrease judgmentalism on people that have different ideas or have different information that they're aware of. Um, I mean, that's one thing that nobody needs and that creates more troubles than anything is the polarization that goes on. So that's a great point is, is, is just the understanding of, of, you know, that goes for anything in life, right? We're, we're, we're trying to understand what, how the other person's feeling and why they're seeing it in such a way. And a lot of times during all this, you know, that that's something right from the, the get go, we really talked about a lot was, you know, being, even with my kids in school and uh, things like that was to say like, listen, you need to be very understanding that there's a lot of people that are very scared and very uh, frightened because either uh, the, the situation they're in is such that uh, they, they view it in a very particular way. Uh, so it's very important to understand and be respectful of that person that is fearful. And then hopefully, you know, by doing what we're doing, and trying to get people to question, which is very difficult, which we didn't mention today, but it's very difficult in a sense too, when we talk about censorship and, and fact checking and, and all these, these, these institutions that are, that are looking over data and telling us what's right and wrong. Well, it's just, again, to say like, okay, well, don't take that for, you know, for, for being gold, like read it, make your own decision. Uh, compare it to other things and really sit down and think like what makes sense to me like what what does this all mean 
And if you can do that, at least, you know, you're ahead of the game in, in the sense of not just going into something blindly. Um, and I think that's just hopefully what people can take from this and, and hopefully we can keep giving more information on, on things as things go on. Yeah. yeah. And we'll, and we'll keep trying to pull together and create more support because it's, it's also for people that are getting to points where they're not so comfortable with stuff. Like I think, you know, you had hundreds of thousands of people, I think out marching yeah. the other day in Montreal. So, I mean, it's, although according to the media it was 500,000, but I mean, sorry, 5,000. <laughs> that was the same thing that happened here. You know, they had yeah. a few hundred people that were out. Victoria's fairly small. And um, they said they had about a dozen people or something out. And, and I was actually there seeing it all take place. And I also was there seeing how things got spun, you know? So again, it's like, it, it so confirms how many times what you hear and what's actually happening is not always truthful it's very it can be yeah. very different and especially when you see it firsthand you know you, yeah. you can't you can't dismiss it right but Absolutely. um yeah i know it's it's funny that's that's the one thing that's that is fun with social media is that when people record certain things and put it up it's like well that looked like a lot more than five thousand people you know yeah. so you start to see but but basically it's like there's a lot of people that have different ideas around stuff and and if people are getting to a point where they're getting very concerned about things or if they're hitting a point where they're not comfortable with what is going on now. So, you know, we've talked about this before. So this is like, you know, I've talked to patients where they're really getting, they're just not comfortable masking their four-year-old, you know, or their three-year-old or their five-year-old. Right. And um, especially if they are in daycare all day or if they're in school all day and they're starting to get concerns about it, or if the child's complaining about it and they're not comfortable with it. You know, this is starting where the rubber meets the road. It's kind of like, what do you do at that point? What are your options? And so maybe what we'll do is we'll, we'll post some of those sort of scenarios that are surfacing for people. And what are some of the, what are some of the options for people when they encounter those types of scenarios? Yeah, it's a good idea because even, you know, like we discussed off, off air, you know, like uh, I've, we had an incident here with our school that, uh, yeah. you know, I had to, Re reply on because it's you know they're they're whether it's discussing to our kids the the intervention uh or how things are and you know it it gets to a place where it it, it becomes a little bit touchy because it's you know obviously it's your kids uh but you know we 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 felt very strongly that we had to voice something just because uh we don't find it's the school's place to be telling anybody what to do uh, or telling them that people that are questioning things are being selfish or rude or, or whatever, you know, like everyone has their, their, mm -hmm. their right to have an opinion, which is fine. I totally agree. It's just not their place to tell our kids what is right or, or not. Yeah, so, exactly. So, and I'm sure this has happened a gazillion times with, <laughs> with throughout this, you know, with kids, but yeah, it's, uh, it's concerning for sure. So we'll, we'll see what's coming up. And if you have questions on some of that stuff or, you know, pose them, write us in some questions and we'll see what we can do to try and pull some of that stuff together. And again, we don't need any like, hate sort of comments around stuff like this. I'm not here to try and convince you to do anything. I'm sharing different points of view that are in the literature that lots of different people have been talking about. And it's basically yep. just there to provide another piece of resource or information for you. And go look it up yourself. Anything that I show you, go check it out, read it yourself, and you'll see it's all right there. And, um, and you're going to see, like I said, you're going to have lots of different information. Stats are different all over. So see what feels right for you, go and check information out, and then look at it, try and stay open to reading everything you can, and then see ultimately where it fits before you make big decisions on things, or before you jump on and, and become really um, angry or judgmental about somebody else on either side of it. You know, you see as yeah. much on the other side too, where people are feeling a draw towards away from the official narrative that I'm getting really angry at people that have it. None of that helps. It's like, no. all it does is create more polarization. I think we just need to understand that as individuals, everybody's going to resonate with something different at a different point in time. The best thing we can do is bring the information, look at as much stuff as we can, have a clear picture of as much as we're capable of within this 
mass sort of picture that's always there and we kind of know this piece of it and then try and go moment for moment with staying connected to what ultimately feels right for yourself yeah. and if that changes be open to that changing yeah i like that i i really like the way you're talking about resonating because uh, i think that's the only way that we can you know help people is to help them resonate at a higher level so that you know we can have an impact on for the better good of, of everyone you know we're, we're looking at to not bring everyone down we we're the, the whole purpose of this is not to create conflict is to create some connection again to a better understanding of where we're going what we would need to do to optimize that um so that's awesome nice well kevin for I think, um, I mean, I know people in Quebec know how to get a hold of you, but if anybody wants yeah. to learn more about you guys or come and see you personally in clinic, where can people meet you? Where can they learn more about the work you guys are doing? Well, I think on our, on, on our website, vitalitytherapy.ca uh, um, is probably the easiest one. Um, we have a few things going on too, trying to help out our industry. So the Osteo Connection is our podcast, uh, which is on every, um, every platform. Yeah, it's a fun, it's a fun it's a fun uh, I've, I've done the interview with you guys on that yeah. too um, before uh, with my book and uh, yeah it's a it's a fun you guys have a good group dynamic it keeps it light and fun and uh, and it's humorous so yeah you guys do a great job with it and I think we're, we'll probably have something coming out very soon that'll be more clinic based uh, podcast uh, to 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 expand on some of the ideas we're talking about here so. Um, and in with, with the aim of, of, you know, helping people with their questions on health and everything else too. So that's, nice. uh, that's to, to be, uh, announced soon. So mm -hmm. people listening, if you have any questions that you would like to learn more about, pose them, write some questions for us in the, yeah. in the show notes or, or sorry, in the post some questions and then we'll do our best to try and pull some of that information together and see what we can find and then try and have an open dialogue around it. That'd be awesome. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us, Kevin. Awesome to chat with you around this and uh, let's, let's chat soon. Okay. Sounds good. Well, that was awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time to invest in your health and well-being. Since this podcast is brand new, reviews and subscribers are so vital for us to get off the ground and share this really important information. So if you found this information valuable, please post a review and subscribe to the podcast so you'll get our newest episodes. Also, if you know of someone who would benefit from this, please share it with them. You can also find us on Instagram at hashtag inspirehealthpodcast. If you have a question that you'd like to be addressed, direct message me on Instagram or leave a comment on one of my posts. I would love to hear from you. And you can grab our show notes and free resources for each episode at inspirehealthpodcast.com. So be sure to go online and check it out.